and now uh, to start uh, us off on uh, finance views of money uh, we are very very happy to have one of the most influential researchers in macro finance uh, my advisor Raghu Rajan uh, to uh, give introductory remarks and uh, set the stage for today's topic. Aragu, I'll turn it over to you now and you have 15 minutes. Great, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mariam, for asking me. And uh, I have to say, when you asked me, I, I thought, what do I know about money? What do I know about inflation? Uh, I just happen to have been a central banker for some time, but uh, let me try. Um, what we have today is really a discussion of the roots of inflation. And uh, we have, uh, um, you know, uh, to set the stage for what we're gonna talk about, uh, think about two regimes after the collapse of the Bretton Woods system. We had the pre-1980s regime and we had the post-1980s regime. And what came in between was really in many ways a marriage of theory and practice on, uh, uh, on how to fight inflation. Uh, on the theory side, we had the famous Kidman and Prescott rules versus discretion paper and follow-on papers after that. And on the practical side, we had Paul Volcker who uh, raised interest rates uh, uh, very, very high and managed, uh, uh, according to many, to defeat inflation in the United States once and for all. And uh, in this theory uh, and uh, practice, there was a central role for expectations. And uh, given that expectations had to be uh, contained by the appropriate rules, uh, essentially central banks went to an anti-inflation mandate. Uh, the popularity of inflation targeting starting in New Zealand towards the end of the 80s and spreading across the world. And the idea is they would be given a mandate and they would be given operational independence. And uh, that combination would replicate what happened in the United States and bring down inflation everywhere. And it worked. Countries across the world from Britain to Brazil brought down inflation uh, often after adopting inflation targeting. And the, these were countries, you know, Brazil, for example, had historically high levels of inflation uh, just prior to moving towards the regime. Now, uh, you know, obviously uh, uh, academia started questioning at some point, uh, was it really uh, central banks in this new regime. After all, all manner of countries brought down inflation regardless of their macroeconomic conditions. And uh, the question was, could it have been the global environment? For example, some have argued that the growing integration of labor markets around the world, essentially the arrival of China into the global labor markets uh, created a lot of competition between countries and uh, that uh, depressed uh, the wage setting power of unions in industrial countries uh, had some effect on inflation uh, over time. Um, others argue that perhaps this was the disinflationary effects of stronger productivity growth in countries like China, uh, a growing uh, global uh, productivity wave. Uh, and this created what some people call good deflation uh, or good deflationary forces uh, because of the enhancement globally in productivity, even if uh, productivity in advanced countries was much slower. Uh, and then there are other arguments that somehow, uh, you know, because of aging, because of the export-led strategies uh, of, uh, of some of the emerging markets, again, especially China, uh, we had uh, a savings glut. Uh, that's Ben Bernanke's term. Um, other terms are secular stagnation. Uh, and these, uh, you know, uh, more recently have become the focus of uh, attention as central banks have found themselves singularly unable uh, to raise inflation. Because the problem, that emerged uh, in the 2000s was that, you know, if uh, central banks, um, you know, were responsible, they were too successful. The new problem was too low inflation. And as we know, uh, as economists, some inflation is good to deal with frictions, frictions such as the downward stickiness of wages. Um, one way to deal with a situation where real wages is too, are too high is basically 
uh, have uh, you know uh, nominal wages go up at less than the rate of inflation. That why you that way you bring down real wages. So having too low inflation makes it difficult to do these things. Uh, similarly, on the monetary side, uh, with uh, uh, you know very low inflation, the zero low bound for interest rates starts kicking in. In which case, you get excessively high real interest rates. And uh, that may again impede economic growth and activity. And, and the biggest worry, uh, of course, of really low inflation was that we would get debt deflationary downward spirals. Uh, deflation itself would spiral downwards. And this was the theory everybody worried about, citing the example of the Great Depression as something that developed countries could be facing. And of course, Japan soon became the poster child for the downsides of poor monetary management. Uh, as you know, Japanese growth collapsed uh, from you know, close to four and a half, five percent in the 70s and the 80s uh, to uh, two or three percent in the 90s after a period of uh, fairly slow growth post the bubble collapse uh, in the late 1980s. And, and Japan has had really low inflation uh, mingled with periods of deflation. Um, and, and this has been a worry for many scholars. How do we get out of this? Um, as a footnote, Japan has never had spiraling deflation, which is the worry that many people have of the consequences of deflation. Nevertheless, uh, hordes of academics descended on Japan to offer monetary advice. Um, some, you know, uh, offer the caveat, maybe there's nothing wrong with Japan. Uh, it's simply a consequence of uh, population aging and a declining labor force. If you look at per capita output, uh, it looks very comparable to Europe and the United States. But generally, there was a sense that uh, Japan uh, uh, was, uh, or Japanization was the coming problem for industrial countries. And to avoid that, you had to act early uh, and, uh, and in fact, undo the lessons of the past. And uh, Paul Krugman said this very, very vividly, uh, that uh, rather than uh, you know, focus on credibility, focus in a sense on undoing credibility, have a credible commitment to engage in irresponsible monetary policy in order to start getting inflation up. And the idea here is the worry that people may have is as soon as inflation comes up, the central banks will revert to, to form and uh, given their mandate will uh, tighten monetary policy. If you want to come out of the deep hole of very low uh, inflationary expectations, you need to be able to commit that you will go to much higher levels of inflation, and that requires a reverse kind of commitment. Others have proposed, Olivier Blanchard, for example, raise the inflation target. And uh, of course, what he had in mind was that by raising the inflation target, uh, you make it possible to have more inflation before the central bank feels compelled to come in. Uh, effectively, that means a higher inflation path. Of course, people criticize that saying you can't even raise inflation in the first place. How do you, um, how do you raise the target and expect to meet that? And obviously he, what he meant was you deal with, uh, you, you have a greater effect on expectations. Others have, uh, as the Federal Reserve has uh, argued recently, have a symmetric target. Again, run the economy a little hot if it has been running a little cold. Uh, that is another way of being somewhat irresponsible on the higher side so that inflationary expectations can be pulled up. Um, other forms of price level targeting, exchange rate targeting, forward guidance, all these important to say essentially by the argument that what the central banks did was change expectations and perhaps they've been overly successful. And now for a variety of reasons, not just the central banks doing, inflationary expectations are too low they need to be elevated. How better to do it than again, focus on changing the quote unquote rules so that uh, expectations change. And of course, it's not just the rules that central bankers have tried. They're using new instruments, both on the short end and the long end. On the short end, negative interest rates. Uh, of course, Marcus has talked about the fact that perhaps if you go too negative, you get a reversal interest rate because of the uh, depletion of bank capital. You've got uh, Ben Bernanke coming out with quantitative easing. Uh, Japan has been in the forefront of many new uh, techniques, flooding the, uh, the market with, uh, with reserves, for example. And of course, most recently, 
uh, arguments that we need to move towards monetary financing of the fiscal deficit, precisely what many developing countries and uh, emerging markets got rid of in the past in order to quell inflation. Um, uh, of course, there are new concerns about what is happening with central bank policy. Uh, does the easy money create excess liquidity? leverage and financial stability risks. And could this in fact be keeping inflation low? Because what you have in mind is a market anticipating a regular set of crises, one crisis after another, which effectively makes low growth for long credible and keeps inflation and interest rates low. Uh, so it's, it's financial instability, which in a sense verifies uh, expectations uh, which are really low in terms of inflation and growth. Uh, another concern is whether there's a prisoner's dilemma feature across central banks. That is, once you get into this low for long, no one really wants to normalize uh, because there's a risk that exchange rate appreciation uh, would hit them first and consequently slow their growth. And uh, uh, this is a concern that, uh, that some have. Um, Others see a new opportunity in this wonderful world of low inflation. Of course, I'm referring here to uh, modern monetary theory, MMT, that John Cochran refers to as magical monetary theory. And the, the idea here is why not spend until inflation picks up? And you know, given uh, that that happens only when we get to full employment, given that many economies have substantial slack, this is nirvana for those who want to spend, bring out these spending plans and finance it by printing money. I think the focus on printing money to finance is a little, uh, is a little besides the point. Uh, but essentially, the, the argument here is Japan shows the way. Uh, spending without inflation, they've uh, elevated debt to GDP to astronomical, astronomical numbers, but still interest rates are really low. So uh, MMT now is a challenge because many uh, um, political authorities embrace it as the way forward. So coming to the two papers in the conference then, given this scene setting, uh, they complement each other nicely. They have a lot of similarities, apart from the fact that they each have three authors, two with Germ German origin names and one with Eastern European origin names. Uh, but there's more than that. Uh, they are really, uh, they span the two regimes. Uh, Drexler, Savov and Schnabel look at how inflation was brought under control pre-1980s and they tend to be a little more dismissive about the role of expectations uh, and the credibility that Volcker brought in. Uh, Bruno Meyer, Merkel, and Sanikov focus on a different question, which is the question that we talked about for today. Why does Japan not still have inflation despite meeting all the conditions for fiscal dominance? Um, why is it possible that MMT may be right until it is not. And they raise the question of the risks associated also with an MMT-like uh, like structure. So they really span both regimes we talked about. Last two minutes, let me explain these very different approaches, uh, leaving it to the discussants to fill in the details. Uh, in uh, Drexler, Schnabel, uh, Schnabel and Savov, DSS, uh, it's not really about central bank credibility or the role of expectations. That may be embedded if they wrote a, uh, a, a, a theoretical model, but essentially their argument is regulation cues suppressed deposit rates. That made savings unattractive and boosted consumption demand, especially when uh, you know regulation cues started binding. Uh, also, because deposits growth was slower at, in those situations, bank lending also fell off, resulted, resulting in muted investment and supply. And so you had stag stagflation, uh, demand increasing because people moved away from savings towards spending and supply not keeping pace because credit growth was relatively slow. It's, it's an interesting uh, um, idea. Uh, what is astonishing is how much support they find for it in the data, and I'll come to that in a second. But the main point here is that Volcker, central bank credibility and expectations were peripheral to this story. Uh, and, you know, in a sense, uh, the nature of this paper is basically saying uh, the true uh, reason it came down is something nobody really has talked about which is regulation Q. And of course, uh, on par with their earlier 
work on deposit, the deposit channel of transmission, uh, they find effects which, uh, which you know, a priori, I wouldn't think they would find, but seem very persuasive once they find it. Uh, so it certainly complements their earlier work also on the deposit channel of transmission because it's an example of, of how deposits matter. Uh, just a couple of thoughts uh, without attempting to preempt the discussion. Uh, the big question here is, could the depositors not substitute to other forms of financial investment? For example, there was a period when SNLs were offering more. Did they actually move to the SNLs? And could they have moved to other fixed income instruments? Why didn't those start up? Uh, also hard to see the effects in aggregate savings. I've looked at aggregate savings over this time. Uh, I guess uh, patterns are in the eye of the beholder, but you would expect to see aggregate savings fall considerably and, and they don't. Um, and lastly, a question, uh, should local inflation be non-traded rather than traded goods, especially when you have different regulations binding across different areas in the United States, do they find it? That's a question uh, that they can uh, perhaps answer later. Uh, turning to the uh, BMS paper, uh, essentially, uh, this starts with the fiscal theory of the price level. Basically, that theory says the price level is a plug number that equates the present value of real government surpluses to the nominal value of government liabilities. And by government liabilities, we include money and bonds, which is why the emphasis on, uh, on money in, uh, in uh, the MMT world is perhaps overly extreme. But the, the question here is, Japan has been running deficits for some time. If you extrapolate that going forward, uh, it's a negative uh, present value of uh, fiscal deficits. Let's assume there's some reason they turn it around. Nevertheless, any present value of fiscal deficits, given the mounting level of debt, should imply the price level in Japan should be going up. That it has not is a puzzle for the fiscal theory of the price level. And of course, BMS say, well, maybe there are some other terms which people value and uh, which are such that you can actually issue additional government liabilities and uh, still not uh, get uh, what the fiscal theory of the price level suggests, a higher prices, a higher price level as you issue more of them. Uh, and essentially two other sources of value they point to, one they emphasize in this paper, the value of government liabilities as safe assets, which helps the private sector deal with idiosyncratic risk and the value of money in payments. They don't focus on that here. Now, the whole point of the paper is these additional sources of value can grow, perhaps even faster than the economy. They have a bubble-like feature and can be used by the government to issue additional non-inflationary debt. In other words, debt to GDP can rise without inflation, explaining Japan. Is this nuts? Obviously not. Think about Bitcoin, no real source of value. Of course, it is protected against overissue, but there's so many things that are protected against overissue and have no value. Bitcoin seems to have value. Why? That's really the bubble-like feature that one could argue that BMS focuses on. They have a warning to the MMTers, I think, which is that when confidence collapses, the descent into inflation can be much more dramatic than, than you think. Uh, of course, when that happens, it could happen a long time from now, in which case they're sympathetic with the MMTers. So um, the, the real issue is they focus much more on forward-looking expectations and how, how much are these forward-looking expectations um, uh, important? Uh, in a sense, they take a very different view from DSS. And uh, you know, essentially you need expectations that there will be a bubble in uh, government uh, assets and that bubble can be in fact exploited to raise more government debt. Uh, I'm happy to send other comments separately to the authors, but these are two great papers that span very interesting aspects of the problem and look forward to the presentations and the discussions. I hope that satisfies you, Mariam, and does what you asked for. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks so much, Raghu. It was like great, way beyond anyone's expectations. So with that, I pass it on to Marcus. Uh, please, Marcus, you have 30 minutes. Thanks a lot, uh, Mariam, and thanks, uh, Raghu, for this nice uh, introductory remarks. Um, 
Uh, I've broadened the title a little bit. So debt as safe asset and money is of course a particular form of debt. It just has infinite maturity uh, in its never coming due. In particular, when we pay interest on reserves, it's a particular form of debt. It's joint work with Sebastian Merkel, who is on the market this year. So you should look at him. And he's also in the, in the chat box answering all the tough questions you have and also joined with uh, Yuli Sanikov. So the questions we would like to address are Raghu mentioned already, but more generally, how much government debt can actually the market absorb? How much can the government offer? And how much will the market then take? And at what interest rate, at what real interest rate? Is there a debt laffer curve? So that actually there's a limit how much debt you can raise before things go badly? And what's the impact on inflation? And in particular, we would like to understand is there a way that you can actually issue debt as like a Ponzi scheme for the government without violating individual transversality conditions? Okay, so there's no tra transversality conditions violated. And then what we will do here is we we'll define a safe asset has particular features. What are the features? And the retrading feature would be particularly important for the safe asset. And then we will argue why the government has a particular power to issue safe assets and not private firms. And when you can might lose uh, the, the safe asset status. And with this whole apparatus, we can actually then approach uh, the debt valuation puzzle for the US and for Japan, I will come to that. And, uh, and how we can modify the representation asset pricing model and the fiscal theory of the price level uh, way of approaching things and how one has to modify it. And as Raghu mentioned already, traditionally, we think of uh, this way. So when we price the debt level, we have the tax revenue of, uh, of the government over different periods S minus the government expenditures, this G. That's the primary surplus. You discount it with a stochastic discount factor. And then you get the value of the total outstanding debt. So script D is essentially the nominal value divided by the price value. It's the value of all debt. And that's essentially the FTPL equation, the fiscal view of the price level equation. And that's also what's in the debt valuation equation, what Stein and his co-authors have used as well. But if you look at the Japanese experience, what you see is that if you look at the primary surpluses, except for 10 years, from 1960 onwards, the primary surplus of Japan was negative for the last 60 years, except for 10 years. So 50 out of 60 years at least, uh, the primary surplus was negative. And I don't think there's any hope it will become positive in the near future at all. So if you take this equation seriously, it has to be a negative present value of the whole thing. So this valuation is very, very challenging. And I think uh, Stein and others have done it for the US and they also find you can actually not correctly uh, price the government debt this way. And we would like to understand, can we actually resurrect this type of form of equation or what's missing in this equation in order to really uh, do this well. And uh, so what we are doing is essentially we're saying if you do any asset pricing, you, we do the traditional asset pricing where you have the cash flow and you take the present value, expected present value of the cash flow, I will come to the discount factors later what exactly this, the right ones are, plus you get a service flow, some convenience yield more broadly but it's a service flow and we have to price and value that the service flow as well. And I would like to explain what the, the service flows are. So let me just illustrate a simple case. Let me illustrate two guys, Mr. A and Mrs. B, and two assets, one which is a safe asset. And for simplicity, I assume for the safe asset has no cash flow at all, never pays any dividends, no interest in all the future. And then there's another asset, let's call it some capital, uh, it pays cash flow, but has no service flow. That's like what we traditionally do in asset pricing. So that's a portfolio consisting of what the zero is, no cash flow. And then there's a, another asset which has some cash flow, CF for cash flow. And these are two guys, that's their portfolio is 50-50. Then what happens, then the event three comes along, then there's some shock and both assets, both have A has a positive shock, so his cash flows expand and B has a negative shock, cash flows decline. And in this branch of the event, it's the other way around. So it's just the opposite. So what a safe asset does is essentially it has no cash flow whatsoever, but it allows one to retrade. So that's uh, essentially the situation we are facing. But what it can do with a safe asset, if it has value, they can retrade. Now suddenly it can be that, you know, B is selling some of his safe asset in return of getting from A some of this 
a cash flow asset. Okay, so that's in this state of the world, there's some retrading going on in this direction. And in the other state of the world where the shock structure was the opposite, the retrading occurs in the opposite direction. So the safe asset moves from A to B and the cash flow asset moves from B to A. So in a sense, in a world where there's an incomplete market, so I should have mentioned this, that so the incomplete markets, you cannot ex ante contract contingent claims to ensure yourself against the shock of whether they go up or down, but by precautionary saving in this service flow asset, let's call it safe asset, uh, you can read, read it, sell some of this asset and then buy in for this cash flow asset. And this direction might go in one direction or the other direction, depending which state of the world uh, realizes. And this way, the safe asset, even though it never pays any dividends, it doesn't pay any cash flows or interest or anything, it serves a useful role by partially completing the market. So it overcomes this market incompleteness. And this way, these two agents, A and B, can actually uh, trade along the lines. They cannot, it's not fully completing, but it is a partial way of ensuring each other across these two states of the world. And of course, the history keeps on going and this repeats further and further. The other big important feature, of course, is that this asset, which has zero cash flows, only the service flows, uh, by having this precautionary trading motive plus retrading, and that's bubbly. So it's a bubbly feature and it's very, very fragile. Okay, that's essentially what's going on. And this goes back to, uh, and you can see later on, we introduce aggregate risk. You can see you have a positive beta on this cash flow risk. If you do traditional asset pricing, you get a positive beta, but the service flow can have a negative beta. So the total beta of the two can be negative. And it goes back to some features I talked to one and a long time ago about what are the, the characteristics of safe asset. And we had this good friend analogy and the safe asset ontology. So what's a safe asset? A safe asset is an asset which is around when you're in need. That's like a good friend. And it has to be um, you know, valuable and liquid when you need it. So if you have idiosyncratic shocks, like in this example, I just illustrated it, uh, then it's actually around, you say a negative shock, you need some funds, you have to buy a new car, or whatever it is, new washing machine, you can sell these funds, you save it for precautionary reasons, and you sell it to somebody who didn't have a shock. And what's really important for you is that you can retrade the safe asset with a very low bid ask spread. Now we'll come back to that. If you have aggregate shocks, but then the whole thing gets even more interesting because an aggregate shock here, we consider primarily that the volatility is going up. So now you have more volatility. And what we'll see that whenever there's an aggregate shock, which is, you know, on the one hand, the economy is going down. On the other hand, the volatility is going up. But then actually you value this type of safe assets even more. And that creates actually this, for this component, a negative beta. Okay, and this negative beta in this weighted fashion can be large enough that the whole beta of the safe asset is negative on its own. Okay. So I mean, in, maybe in a, quick question, a quick question about this. I think Valentin asked me to uh, interrupt you a few times along the way. So um, other, other assets could also be good friends, maybe not as good a friend as a government bond, but like what if agents could trade, you know, the aggregate stock market with small bid ask spreads, for example, you know, would that be a partial substitute? Presumably the equilibrium of the model would now be a different one. Yeah, so, so you can have an additional stock market. So what we argue that the government bond is a particular good safe asset because it's a bubble in the bubble might burst. And then it depends whether you have some taxing power to support the bubble. A private company might not be able to really support uh, them and say, okay, we raise some additional revenue somehow and put our balance sheet more than a balance sheet behind it to, to support it. So that's why it's uh, government can defend this bubble and it's more credible that the government will defend it. Of course, it's an off equilibrium possibility that it will defend. Private companies have it harder to do, but I agree with you. There's some safety aspects which private uh, firms can also provide. Uh, it's not necessarily a zero one in the model, it's a zero one, uh, but uh, I think government uh, assets are more natural in this uh, regard. So the second feature, that's a good point. So the second feature is so I will come at the end about loss of the safe asset status and how to defend it. That's also the same is true for emerging market economies. The second point is the safe asset ontology, and that's the bubbly feature that there is an equilibrium, of course, where the bubble exists and actually we can partially ensure each other, overcome this incomplete markets uh, features. And uh, there's another equilibrium where the bubble doesn't exist and the safe asset status might be lost. And then it actually depends on the taxing power at least have the off equilibrium threat that you have this fiscal space 
to defend the safe asset status of the bubble. Okay, so that's that's a big picture we are after. We are be, after we would change the asset pricing phenomenon to have the present value of the cash flows plus the service flows, which come in, in a safe asset setting, in our setting as retrading. Of course, you have other service flows. You can relax the collateral constraint and have a Lagrange multiplier here. That's also would be in that. We're not focusing, we focus on this retrading component here. Now, here's the model. So it's a very simple model. We can solve it in closed form. So here, everybody has log utility. The time preference rate is rho. And the net worth, that's the change in the net worth, is change in consumption, pushes net worth down. Then the return of the bond holding, that's the real return on the bond holding. One minus theta, theta is a fraction of the wealth you put into the bonds. One minus theta is a fraction of wealth you put into a physical capital. And that's the excess return you get from physical capital. So that's how your net worth evolves. Each citizen in the country, there's a continuum of citizens, they have their own uh, capital stock, little k, superscript i tilde. And then there's a TFP, which can be time bearing. Later on, I'll make it time bearing. And, and that's the output of this particular citizen. That's his balance sheet. Um, here's some physical capital. Here, on top of it, you can also hold some government bond, or you can call it money, whatever you want. And that's his net worth on the liability side. The capital stock evolves if he invests more, the investment rate is iota then the capital stock is going up. So this, this phi function is a concave function. So there's diminishing uh, returns if you invest more, the investment rate is going up. It's an adjustment cost function, very normal in macro literature. And there's a depreciation. Depreciation reduces the capital stock. And the capital is shocked by this idiosyncratic risk. Okay, there's some, everybody has idiosyncratic risk. And the friction in the model is you cannot trade this idiosyncratic risk. There are some idiosyncratic risk you cannot trade. Think of a mom and pop shop, think of a restaurant. There's a lot of idiosyncratic risk you cannot uh, literally trade. So that's, that's the friction in the model. And then there's some aggregate risk potentially. The aggregate risk is this amount of idiosyncratic risk is moving over time. So the sigma tilde, so whenever there's a tilde on top, it's idiosyncratic. This is moving as a state variable, it moves over time. And that can also drive if the volatility goes up. It could also be that the TFP is going down. It's just a reduced for modeling of many other macro phenomena. And it could also be the government expenditure. So little g is the government expenditure per unit of capital in the economy. That's also time varying. And that's driven by some uh, another Brownian. So there's a continuum of Brownian for each citizen. There's a Brownian. And then there's a Brownian, which drives the whole macro economy uh, as an aggregate Brownian. That drives only the idiosyncratic risk here. Yeah? And as I mentioned before, the financial friction is the incorporated markets. You cannot trade claims directly on this idiosyncratic risk. We have to partially insure by buying the safe asset and retrade the safe asset all the time. That's essentially how the economy works. So you buy the safe asset for precautionary reasons. If you have a negative shock, you can sell it and you can buy the machine which broke down or a car which broke down, you buy a new car and so forth. What about the government? The government, uh, as I mentioned, has government expenditure. That's little g times k. You can think of this as a big G. Uh, we do everything scale invariant with respect to the capital stock in the economy. So capital K is the total capital in the economy, physical capital, all the trees in the economy. Then there is a taxation proportional to your capital. And then there's an amount of bonds, the script B. The bond you can issue in mu B is the issuance rate of new bonds. Okay, so it's the percentage change of, of new bonds, uh, if you issue more bonds, can be positive or negative. And the bonds can pay some nominal interest payments, so I is the nominal interest rate, um, uh, just denoting it this way. What's about the government budget constraint? The government budget constraint, government is taxing capital, so that's ta total capital stock. That's the price level, so it's the nominal value of the, uh, of, of the taxes. So taxes times the capital stock is total tax revenue minus G times K is the government expenditures and tau minus G is per unit of K will be the primary surplus. Okay, so that's our primary surplus here. And then the government can, of course, they have to pay the interest on their bonds and they can issue some more bonds. And if they issue more bonds, then they have to pay interest. It relaxes the budget constraint. And what really matters is how many new bonds at what rate they issue bonds relative to the interest rate they have to pay. And it always shows up in this difference. What really matters is this difference. I call this mu check B, which is always includes 
essentially this minus the interest rate. Okay, so that's essentially it. So the goods market clearing condition is just all the consumption goods plus the consumption from the government minus the supply of goods. The supply of goods is given by total output is A times K, but IOTA times K, the investment rate is invested in you know, planting new trees. You have a certain amount of apples. Some of the apples you put in the ground and IOTA times K, there's a number of apples you plant for new trees and A minus IOTA is what you then have to supply to consume and uh, for everybody. Okay, so that's, uh, let's uh, sh just show you a brief way to solve this model. Of course, we have to introduce some little bit more notation. So the QK is the real price of a single tree and K is in uh, the, the number of trees in the economy. So it's the total value of all the capital that's given by that. And then we have to say, what's the return of holding a tree? So you get a dividend yield. So get A times K is the total output, but one minus tau, you have to multiply by that because you have to pay taxes on it, minus iota. And that's essentially the number of apples you can sell on the goods market divided by the price of the tree, that's your dividend yield, okay? Then there's subcapital gains. So the K, the K can grow. That's what we said earlier. That's a drift in K. And then the price Q of the can grow. So it's a drift of K that's uh, theta uh, phi minus delta. That's the drift of K and the drift of QK is just given that. So that's a total expected return here of the capital stock. And then of course I have the price is changing here as well. And so I have the volatility here on the aggregate shock. And then I have the idiosyncratic risk because my capital, uh, this should be actually a little K because it's my little K for the individual I, citizen I, uh, that's also has the idiosyncratic risk component here. Now I have the value of all the, the government bonds and I call QB the value of all the government bonds per unit of K. Okay, it's everything is normalized with respect to the aggregate capital stock because an, I let the K be an independent, it's, everything is scale invariant with respect to K. So that's the real value of government debt uh, and QB is per unit of gold. So that's a, an alternative way of writing the script B over the price level. What's the return, the real return of holding government bonds? It's the nominal return minus the inflation. Okay, and that's essentially the inflation. If you bin, if you, this is minus inflation. So there's a little minus sign here. If you print bonds at a faster rate, or if you issue bonds at a faster rate, inflation is going up. And then if the growth rate of the economy is going up, so that's the growth rate of K, which is also the growth rate of the economy, then actually inflation will be lower and so forth. And if it's a bond and so forth, you can all the other terms. And there's also inflation volatility showing up here, which is from the aggregate shock. There's no idiosyncratic shock because money is not exposed to idiosyncratic shock only to the aggregate inflation shock. And I want to say another word, there's a bond which, you know, if there's no aggregate risk is risk free in the economy, but uh, from an agent perspective, it's not a risk free thing because I plan to buy and sell this bond all the time. So I can also price the cash flow of buying and selling something all the time. Okay, that's, uh, I will come back to this, a dynamic trading strategy of the government bond. And that will be very important when I want to price the things. I will actually not price the bond which as a risk-free asset or if there is no aggregate risk, I will price actually this trading strategy where I use the bond uh, all the time uh, to buy and sell capital stock, depending what my capital, my uh, idiosyncratic risks are. Okay, so what each citizen in this economy has to choose is investment rate, IOTA gives my Tobin's Q equation, a consumption rate is just for log utility rho times the net worth and the optimal portfolio, that's the fraction Theta is the fraction I put into bonds. One minus theta is the fraction I put in the physical capital. That's just the Merton uh, formula, nothing particular. So that's just, again, uh, I forgot the tax rate here. Sorry for that. Um, that's just here what's going on here. And then if, if the idiosyncratic risk goes up, you want to hold less fraction in capital. So if the sigma tilde goes up, if uh, the productivity goes up, you want to hold more in physical capital and so forth. If there's more bond printing, it's like an inflation tax. Uh, you want to hold more in physical capital. That is theta is one minus theta, the fraction you hold in capital. And one minus far theta is the fraction of total wealth uh, in uh, physical capital. And far theta is total fraction of uh, money wealth or bond wealth in, uh, in, the, in the economy. 
Now you can solve this, and I don't have time to go really go through that. So I just show you the results. Uh, so I, you can show it in terms of Gordon growth formulas, uh, which is not totally closed form, but we, we were very excited to solve it totally in closed form. That's the first type of Ayagari type model. You can solve totally in closed form. The value of a tree and the value of, of the money is all given in all exogenous variables. And you can see, for example, if sigma tilde goes up, uh, the value of a tree goes down, but the value of money is actually going up. Okay. And you can also express it in terms of Gordon growth formula expression. And importantly, again, you have the value of all the government bonds is the surplus of the primary surplus of the government, can be negative, like in Japan for 50 out of 60 years divided by R minus G. Just have to take the right R. You have to take the expected return of the net worth of an individual guy. That's the key you have to understand. And then there's a service flow. What's the service flow? The service flow is the insurance, the partial insurance this asset gives you. It depends on the sigma tilde. That's the idiosyncratic risk you're facing. One minus var theta is the fraction you put in capital. So that's a totally idiosyncratic risk you're facing the first term multiplied by the value of the bonds, the real value of the bonds. That's the service flow you get from the retrading all the time. And that enters into the bond price, okay? That's a really the important component um, of what's going on. Now, the, as I said earlier, in order to understand this asset valuation equation, uh, you have to look at the problem slightly differently. Uh, you have two ways to look at it. One is you can look at an individual perspective or I can look at from an aggregate perspective. And let me switch off the aggregate risk for now, just to illustrate the main intuition. From an aggregate perspective, the bond is risk-free if there's no aggregate risk. It's a risk-free asset and I can price it based on that. But from an individual perspective, I don't look at the bond, I look at the dynamic trading strategy where I constantly switch in and out. And I would like to value an asset which is replicating this trading strategy. Okay, and that's what I have to do in order to really value uh, what's going on. And once you do that, so you price the bond part of your portfolio with this dynamic trading strategy. And then you have to integrate in order to get the aggregate again over the citizens. You have to take a weighted sum of the citizens valued or weighted by the net worth share of all the citizens. And what you get essentially is the value of the bond is just the stochastic discount factor you have here, what is stochastic discount factor? It's the individual stochastic discount factor times the well share or net worth share of this agent I. So you sum a weighted sum, that's essentially the relevant stochastic discount factor to get that. And that's for the primary surpluses, that's S times K is the primary surpluses. And that's again, as I mentioned earlier, that's the service flow. You do the same thing and you can split it apart this way and you can price everything correctly uh, this way. If you take an aggregate perspective, and that's what we did in the FTPL paper in the earlier one, uh, then you just say, oh, it's a, let's say there's no aggregate risk, and you take an aggregate perspective, then the stochastic risk factor is just the risk-free rate here, so e to the power of the risk -free minus the risk-free rate, um, and then you would get something here, and then you get the second term, and the second term, you know, it's a bubble term. This is also a bubble term. If you say anything which doesn't pay off any cash flow, it's a bubble term. Here get a different bubble term here because you split essentially total value of uh, the bonds in slightly different ways. But this way you have a nice interpretation of this partial insurance service. Um, yes. So let me talk about the transversality condition. For this, it actually makes a big difference to which perspective you use, look at. And again, it makes it easiest by switching off the aggregate risk uh, for now. From an individual perspective, you have actually a higher discount rate because you price this uh, cash flow which goes in and out from retrading the bonds and you have this idiosyncratic risk and that leads actually to a higher discount rate or lower SDF. And for individuals, the, the transversality condition holds. So each individual's transversality condition is holding. And that's actually what's, this, uh, what's needed because that's you know from optimality as conditions Every individual is solving this thing. Everybody's individual uh, transversality condition is holding. But when I aggregate it up, and if I look at the bond as a risk-free asset, in aggregate, it's a risk-free asset, then it's actually not holding, okay? And that's fine because it doesn't need to hold because of this incomplete markets uh, setting. 
uh, it, it doesn't need to hold, but it has to hold individually. That's the only condition we need in order to be consistent with optimal optimality that it has to have a holding aggregate. There's no need for that uh, at all. And that's coming from this constant retrading what the safe asset has. And that comes to the next point. It's very, very important that you can trade it with a slow bid and ask spread. If you don't have this, then you would destroy essentially. That will not be a good safe asset. An asset which um, uh, doesn't have a low bid ask spread will never be a safe asset. And that also explains why the government or central bank might become a market maker of last resort. Uh, at some point, just to ensure that bid ask price stays low, just to put, uh, defend uh, your safe asset status. And a private company, again, cannot do that. It doesn't have a central bank to support market making. Uh, so let me jump over that. So I'm running way behind time. Let me just say something about the debt laffer curve. What happens if you issue bonds at a faster rate, you will end up with a higher inflation, and that's an inflation tax. That means everybody is changing the portfolio choice between the fiscal capital and the government bond, and they tilt too much more fiscal capital, okay? And this erodes the value of the bond, but the value of the bond is essentially your tax base, okay? Because what you do is you give the service and you make the service, you issue bonds, and the bond itself provides this insurance service but if you issue bonds at a faster rate, then you dilute this bond and the value of the bond is going down. Of course, you get by printing more bonds or issuing more bonds, you create some additional revenue for the uh, government, but you dilute the value of the bond. So essentially your tax rate goes up, but the tax price shrinks like in a traditional Laffer curve. The same analogy holds here as well. You have this Laffer curve phenomenon. Let me illustrate next. Uh, the flight to safety. So what happens if you have a steady state and suddenly you look at a different steady state where the idiosyncratic risk now is much higher. Let's suppose it was 20%, now we move to 25%. So what you see is actually the value of the government bonds is going up and the value of the, uh, the trees is going down. And that's the same. If you add now aggregate risk with time bearing sigma tilde, time bearing idiosyncratic risk, then you get the same thing uh, as well, what you get in this change in this in the steady state uh, by comparative static exercise of steady state. You get this flight to safety. When you're in a recession, it is incredible risk is going up. Everybody wants to flock into the safe asset and they get out of the risky investment things. And the I should have said the investment thing creates some dividends. The safe asset not producing anything. It just gives you this insurance uh, benefit uh, the other assets can't give you. So let me add this. So let's make this uh, uh, aggregate state variable more explicit. Let me say the sigma tilde, this log sigma tilde is following this Ornstein Ullenberg process and uh, you know, it moves around. Okay, so the sigma tilde is not a fixed number anymore. It now moves uh, around. It is, there are certain periods where this incredible risk is high and there are other periods where this incredible risk is low. And the state variable is also governing if this incredible risk is high, TFP is lower as well. Okay, so it moves in this. So what happens in times of recession, idiosyncratic risk is higher and it's also output is lower as well. You can microfound it with several, you can have a new Keynesian model on top of it or whatever you want uh, to microfound that or you just assume it this way. And we also assume the bond issuance rate, uh, you also issue more bonds at a faster speed in times of high idiosyncratic risk uh, as well. So you can assume this too. Again, if you look at these two terms of valuation of the evaluation equation, which was the cash flow term and the service flow term, you can see with this specification that in times of recession, you issue more bonds and output is going down. It is the case, the marginal utility is higher. You get uh, what we typically have. Uh, you, know, you get, you know, cash flow term is close to zero. It's, it's around zero. Okay, and that's also what uh, Stein and Hano and others are finding. And for Japan, they would find a hugely negative number. No? And I, I would love to see uh, the same calculations done for Japan uh, as well. If you look at the cash flow term, it's highly positive. Okay, and that's for different sigmas. If sigma goes up, it goes up even further while the, the, the other term is going down. And that leads me to the betas. Essentially, um, sorry, you Marcus, betas. you have only one minute, so. Yes, I'm almost done. Um, um, so essentially you have two betas. So 
uh, you have the cash flow which is a traditional asset pricing term. So whenever you have a recession, you go in a recession, uh, the cash flows become more negative. So you have a positive beta here and a beta loading. The asset pricing has a positive uh, beta loading. But the service flow, because of course we have assumed in a recession, idiosyncratic risk will be higher. So the value of the safe asset will be higher. So the beta of the cash flow is, is negative, okay? And you can see if you add these two up, so that's what we do here. So you have uh, the blue one is um, the cash flow one, the red one is the service flow. If you add it up, uh, that's the dashed one here, uh, it is still highly negative. So because uh, this, the service flow beta is actually dominating the whole thing. So let me um, highlight now without slides, just uh, jumping to the conclusion. Now I talked already a little bit, what's about the safe asset status? The safe asset status is a particular status you might lose it. And I have not included in the analysis um, how you can lose it and how you can fend it off. Uh, so there's a threat, you might lose it. And for this, actually, what you need as a government, you need some fiscal capacity if there were an attack on, um, on your currency or on your safe asset status, then you can actually raise taxes and actually can back up the whole thing with cash flow, with a cash flow term. Okay, and it's only an off equilibrium threat. Uh, so off equilibrium, you have to be able to do this. You have to be credible enough. If this were to happen, you can do this. So you can't just run up debt infinitely and say, okay, we can still uh, fend this off if there is a doubt that we lose the safe asset status. And that's very, very dangerous because it's a bubble and a bubble pops. It's not a continuous thing. It pops and it leads to a dramatic decline. And the other thing is what I want to emphasize uh, this cash flow, uh, the, the service flow, it relies on this, in, this trading all the time. So you need a very small bit ask spread. And if you don't have this small bit ask spread, uh, then you, the, the service flow is going away. And you could see it in March in the 10 year treasury, is, suddenly the market maker didn't work anymore. And actually it was going away. So the safe asset status for the 10 year treasury went away. And then of course, the Fed helped out and stepped in. So you need something like a market maker of last resort to make sure that um, uh, that this asset stays a safe asset. Or put it differently, you know, in traditionally when central banks were founded, but they were also founded as a debt management office. And uh, that was very important to also have this market making uh, feature on this. So let me come back to the big picture without jumping to the next slide. What we wanted to do here, we wanted to show that this traditional FTPL equation or the debt valuation equation is missing a term. And it's missing this important term, which comes from market frictions. And with, you know, a debt, a government debt can actually partially close this gap from market frictions, but it leads a lot of retrading, but it also changes totally the valuation of the debt equation and the FTPL equation. And of course the FTPL equation is needed to understand how the inflation dynamics will look like, but it's also needed to understand what's a beta. If you go in a recession, why is the government debt appreciating in value? if it's a safe asset. And of course we have other work where we put this in an international context for emerging economy it might be different because your safe asset status is competing with the dollar safe asset status and there are huge spillover effects on that. So let me leave it at this. Uh, thanks again for giving me the opportunity to present here or us to present here. I'm looking forward to Stein's uh, um, evaluation of our arguments. Uh, thanks a lot, Marcus. Stein, the floor is yours. Thank you, Miriam. Let me uh, share my slides. Can you see them? Great, thank you so much. I really enjoyed uh, thinking about this paper. Thank you, uh, Marcus, for your presentation. So. Maybe so, you can make them slightly smaller to be like. Can you see them better now? Yes, now okay. it's great. So the discussion that we're having today kind of revolves around this observation that you know the nominal risk-free interest rate has been kind of below the uh, nominal growth rate of the economy for a long time now. And that's not just true in the last decade or so, that's been kind of true th throughout this post-World uh, War II period. Uh, as you can see, the green line, which is the difference between the risk-free rate and the growth rate is kind of you know negative lots of the time. Um, and so this has led uh, people like Blanchard, but also like Furman and Summers recently to conclude that the government can spend trillions of dollars more on COVID-19 bailouts, municipal government bailouts, Medicare for all, the Green New Deal, uh, 
while insuring taxpayers through traditional countercyclical spending and procyclical tax revenue policies, while all, all along keeping government debt risk free. And so, you know, that's obviously an important discussion, and this paper, you know, contributes to that to that discussion. And actually, like Raghu said in his introductory remarks, sounds a cautionary note about the government's ability to to do all of that while keeping government debt risk free. So the paper starts like this entire literature from the government's you know, period budget constraint, the government has to, uh, you know, fund some spending, get some tax revenue T, walks into the period with some debt from last period, and then issues a bunch of new debt. This new debt could take different maturities. This paper extract, abstracts from the maturity choice. Uh, and you can then, you know, iterate forward on the government budget constraint to get an equation that equates the nominal value of government debt on the left-hand side to the expected present discounted value of nominal surpluses on the right-hand side, that's this first term discounted at the stochastic nominal stochastic discount factor, plus this terminal term here, which is the value uh, as of today of the debt T periods from now. Now note that this equation only imposes no arbitrage, it just prices nominal bonds, it does not impose complete markets. So um, you can easily add money, like the first draft of the paper that I read had money as well, so now M is money. You can divide by the price level to get to the fiscal theory of the price level. So now you get the real value of debt plus money equals to the present discounted value of real surpluses, uh, you know, that terminal term, and then a term in the middle, which, uh, you know, depends on the real value of money, uh, multiplied by a difference in the interest rate between, um, you know, money, which is zero for narrow money, which is positive, if there's interest on reserves uh, and the interest rate on the bonds. Now, the point that the paper makes is that surprise devaluations of existing government debt by like, you know, having surprise inflation doesn't really work very well because, you know, um, you know government debt is too short lived for that to be a powerful channel. Ricardo Ruiz has some interesting uh, results on this. Also the second term, um, the senior rich revenue from money is not that large either because narrow money is fairly small and the reserves which are large have actually a very small interest rate wedge. So that leaves us with this bubble term. And basically it says that the government can create value by running a Ponzi scheme, uh, kind of if this, if this, if this um, um, you know, transversality condition is violated. And so these violations of transversality, you can get them in OLG models, you can get them in perpetual youth models, or you can get them in models with idiosyncratic risk. And that's, uh, you know, it's that last strand that this paper belongs to, right? And so the paper shows that with sufficient idiosyncratic risk, um, you know, you can get the risk-free interest rate to be below the growth rate if the government issues like it expands debt fast enough. Um, and as long as there's enough idiosyncratic risk, then you can get a, an equilibrium uh, where essentially the, the government debt has positive value. And that's even the unique equilibrium as long as the government can commit to increase taxes when bond values fall below a certain threshold. Right? So this is very important. Of the equilibrium path, this is what Marcus said at the end, of the equilibrium path, you know, the government needs to be able to increase taxes radically if government uh, bonds uh, you know, threaten to lose value. And so I think we could ask reasonable questions about what's kind of the political process that guarantees this. I don't think I have a lot of faith in you know, US policymakers raising taxes dramatically and at any point in the future. Uh, but that's what you need to support this equilibrium, okay? And so then the size of the bubble and the price level are jointly pinned down in this model by the debt valuation equation and by goods market clearing. And the key intuition in the paper, as Mark has explained, was that government bonds here help households smooth their consumption, okay? So my main comment on this paper is uh, to think about kind of the role of aggregate risk, right? And so this paper does have aggregate risk. Um, and, um, you know, I want to step back for a second from the, from the notion of idiosyncratic risk and incomplete risk sharing, which, which is at the heart of this paper. But I, I think it's useful to kind of strip that away for a second and help us understand what aggregate risk does in this context, okay? And so I come from an asset pricing perspective that has shown that permanent shocks to productivity or to consumption are really important to generate an equity risk premium, right? And so what I want to argue is that with sufficient permanent output risk in the economy, it actually becomes much harder to sustain bubbles. This transversality condition is much more likely to be satisfied. And that's even true when debt remains risk-free and even when the interest rate is below the growth rate. Okay, and so I want to I want to make a, write down a very simple model based on a you know a, a paper that I have with with these guys here that um, makes that point. It's very very simple. It's 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 kind of a special case of the paper that, of the model that Marcus 
uh, you know, was, was presenting. Right? So imagine you have a CRRA type model, uh, just output risk is priced, Out output growth is IID, and the government issues only one period risk-free debt, and it commits to keeping the, the debt to output ratio constant. Okay, so that's, that's it, that's the model. In this model, debt grows, it grows at the same rate as GDP, okay, because the debt to output ratio is constant. Now, in that model, it's very easy to show that, you know, the value of the debt is the present discounted value of future surpluses plus this terminal term. Now, the, the correct transversality condition in this model is not whether risk-free rate is, is, is greater than the growth rate of the economy. The correct transversality condition is this one here, right? And it has, in particular, these two extra terms here, a Jensen term, which is not important because you know the volatility of output growth sigma is pretty small. But this term here, gamma times sigma, which is the equity risk premium, the unlevered equity risk premium. So in particular, the Blanchard condition, if I can call it that, that the risk-free rate is below the great growth rate of the economy is neither necessary nor sufficient for the transversality condition to be violated. Right? What matters is this condition here. Now, if we just plug in some realistic numbers, you know, in particular, plugging in for numbers that have kind of the risk rate below the growth rate, then what you can see is that it's actually pretty easy to satisfy this condition, okay? And in particular, if you choose your maximum Sharpe ratio to be, for example, one, which is a good number, I think, for the maximum Sharpe ratio in the U.S. economy, then this condition is easily satisfied. In other words, you get no transversality condition violations. As long as the maximum Sharpe ratio in the economy is above 0.25, which is a pretty low number, you, uh, the transversality condition will hold in this model. And the intuition is that the government debt value at some terminal date T will inherit the permanent output risk in, out, in, in, in GDP. And in, that, and in that world, RF minus G is not the correct discount rate for this debt term uh, when, when we have permanent shocks. That's true, even when debt is risk-free. So there's that long run output risk in GDP that is inherited by debt. And even when debt is risk-free, you know, that, you know, that shows up in the correct discount rate. Okay, and now you don't need, so it turns out you don't need to have, assume a constant debt to output ratio. Uh, in the US, a debt to output is, is a stationary process. You get the same transversality condition, condition, uh, you know, condition that I showed you. Now, the only time you can get violations is if debt to output is non-stationary. Okay, so let's assume debt to output ratio follows a martingale um, with some counter-cyclical debt issuance. So the government raises debt in bad times. In that case, the transversality condition has this extra term, uh, which depends on this counter-cyclicality of government debt. Uh, and so now you can actually get violations of TVC. Okay. So in, so in particular, if you now want the, TV, the TVC to hold, the government has to have a less aggressive countercyclical debt policy. There's a limit to how aggressive uh, countercyclical debt issuance can be. And the intuition is that the government creates itself an arbitrage opportunity when debt to output is non-stationary. When the agents are sufficiently risk averse, the insurance that's provided by this countercyclical debt issuance is so valuable that the price of a claim to this debt fails to converge to zero, okay? And that's kind of similar to the intuition we're getting from this incomplete markets model here, right? And so I think what I've just shown you, the same argument should apply here, especially in, since this model has aggregate risk. And so the question is, why doesn't it apply, right? And so I think I can think of two possibilities, either that, you know, since we work with locked preferences here, risk aversion is one, the TVC is violated, but only because we have unrealistically low maximum Sharpe ratio in this model. Okay? The model does not match the equity risk premium. Or, and or, uh, the model does not match the stationary nature of debt to GDP in the data, which is well described by an ER2. And maybe here debt does follow a martingale, and maybe it is very, and maybe debt issuance policy is very counter cyclical. Um, you know, and that's why we have, you know, violations from TVC. So it's maybe a combination of these two things that's going on. I would like to understand this better. I think the paper uh, can easily, can easily speak to these, to both of these issues. Now, this is a paper with incomplete markets. So far, I've just shown you an, a model with, with, you know, with, with a rep agent. Uh, so, you know, we do have kind of this incomplete risk sharing going on here. And so that does increase, create a pot, you know, a strong precautionary savings effect, which lowers the risk-free rate and all else equal makes the TBC more likely to fail, right? But um, that force, that precautionary savings force fights the equity risk premium effect that I just described. And, and that force makes the TBC more likely to hold. Now with incomplete markets, uh, in, if, in, if idiosyncratic income risk is correlated with the aggregate state of the economy, right? So we get counter-cyclical idiosyncratic income risk, then the equity risk premium will be larger still, 
And so that additional risk premium from the countercyclical reducing predicate income risk will make the TBC even more likely to hold. Right? And so I think it's ambiguous whether the precautionary savings effect is large enough to offset the additional risk premium effect and hence whether this incomplete risk sharing channel makes the TBC more or less likely to be violated. Um, and related to that, you know, I wonder to what extent incomplete risk sharing is a quantitatively plausible mechanism to generate this large government debt valuation puzzle that we see in the data. Um, and then, you know, a final point on this is, you know, I think this intuition on inc incomplete markets applies to every country. Now, there's several countries that don't have uh, a government debt valuation puzzle like the UK. And so that I think kind of uh, requires a little bit more explanation as well. Okay, so then if it's not, you know, if it's not incomplete markets, and I'm not yeah, saying sorry, it's not, it's time. You have one minute. One minute, last point I want to make. If it's not incomplete, so you know what's nice about this paper is it, it kind of links that that um, so that convenience yield to income to um, incomplete markets, right? Now it's possible there's other sources of, of convenience yield that are not related to incomplete markets, um, you know. And more generally, I think convenience yields are a very promising way to close the government debt valuation equation, um, you know. And you know, to some and and so to some extent, that could be uh, related to uh, to convenience from from a better risk sharing, but it need not be, okay. So let me summarize. I think you know the paper asks a very important question: Can the U.S. safely borrow trillions of dollars more? Uh, I very much like the theoretical connection that the paper develops between this bubble term and the convenience services arising from incomplete risk sharing. I question whether the model generates a high enough maximum sharp ratio because. You know, if it doesn't, uh, you know, then that could uh, lead it to uh, conclude that the TVC is violated, whereas in fact it's not with a higher risk premium, uh, and or similarly whether it produces debt to GDP ratios that look like in the data. Um, I question whether the U.S. government is unique in its ability to help agents smooth consumption. You know, what if agents could trade the aggregate stock market? What about different countries that have their own bonds? And then finally, I think convenience yields could have other origins besides incomplete risk sharing, besides helping incomplete risk sharing. Uh, and so I want, you know, it would be nice to quantify how much incomplete risk sharing can explain as a source of convenience yields, kind of given the amount of idiosyncratic income risk that we see in the data. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Stein. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, I just wanted to remind everybody, please raise your hands in the chat and, and we're going to call on you. So I want to first uh, uh, ask Marcus if you want to uh, comment on Stein comments, and uh, then we're going to go to uh, questions. Yes, uh, thanks a lot, Stein. Uh, very insightful. Uh, I try to learn more from that. So I agree with you. We can do it with a constant relative risk of utility function. Actually, we did it more generally, but you don't have the closed form solution anymore. Then you have to do more numerical things. Uh, this with closed form solution only works with log utility. Um, so about so, I also agree we have to still quantify. So far, we haven't quantified the analysis, so we have to figure out the numbers. Why does the UK doesn't have this bubble term? It doesn't. You, you, there are always two equilibria: a bubble equilibrium and a non-bubble equilibrium, in a sense. So you can always be in one of the two. And in the international context, you also have to keep in mind that you're competing with other safe assets. So that makes it harder to sustain your own bubble. And that's, you know, the US is in a particular role, Japan and Germany, they're in a particular role that they can actually uh, do this. So we haven't done looked across the countries where it's more prominent, where it's less prominent, but that's very consistent with our uh, framework as well. Uh, in a sense, you can see this, it opens up what we're doing is open up the convenience yield terms. And there are, of course, other reasons why there might be a convenience yield. Uh, ours relies very much on retrading, so you can relate this to this. And we also feel like our other convenience yield interpretation doesn't have the right beta, so they don't have the right co-movement during recession. So in our setting, it will be the case that risk sharing becomes more and more important in, the, in recessions and less important in booms. So you get this negative beta component coming in. If it's you know, relaxing some, uh, if it's you know, cash and advance constraint or any other constraints, which could be a different uh, convenience yield, in recessions, you have fewer transactions, so the money is not so tight anymore. So that might go in the opposite direction. So in terms of uh, the co-movement, uh, this risk sharing interpretation we are giving or in completing the markets and partial risk sharing through this precautionary savings goes in the right direction in this sense. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, I'm going to ask uh, first uh, Chris Sims, uh, uh, please uh, ask your question. You should be unmuted. 
Um, Stein um, said that the way that um, Marcus's model um, generates uniqueness is an often equilibrium, a credible off equilibrium threat that the government can, can massively raise taxes. Um, now in, a, in an overlapping generations model with bubbles like this, um, it's not necessary that the, that the off equilibrium tax um, effort be large. And in fact, uniqueness can be guaranteed with any level of primary surplus, so long as it's uh, positive. Um, and the equilibrium with very small uh, primary surpluses is um, arbitrarily close to the pure bubble equilibrium. I'm wondering if that, this is true in Marcus's model as well. Does it, is it necessary that to get uniqueness to have the potential of a large fiscal effort off the, off the equilibrium path? No, you don't need to. You can have a small uh, tax increase will do. So as long as you can sustain it sufficiently long, I can commit to it. Uh, I think you don't have a large fiscal defense line here. It's the same thing as any OLG framework. All right, so uh, let's uh, end this uh, with one more question from Neil. Uh, Neil, uh, you should be um, uh, uh, unmuted. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, I just, uh, you know, quickly, because uh, there has been some response in the uh, Q&A, just wanted to mention the existence of, you know, what I've always thought of, as people tell me, is the safest asset is gold. And that is, uh, is if there is a, is gold in the model, for instance, uh, what are the implications? Can the government still get away with exploiting a bubble if, uh, you know, gold exists and let's assume go uh, gold is uh, easily able to be uh, traded or there exist claims that can be uh, written that allow uh, the trading of gold without uh, high transaction costs? Yeah, that's it's a good point, but you almost give a, gave the answer on your own. It's it's really it has to be easily tradable, and if gold is easily tradable by having some ETFs on gold or whatever it is, then it limits the space of the government to issue the issuing growth rate of bonds is limited. So the government cannot because you have then competing safe asset, and then the question is which equilibrium will materialize and which equilibrium can support, and. If gold can be easily traded, it really limits the government space. It's very similar uh, to another work we did where the have an international context where the emerging market e economy has its own safe asset, tries to have its own safe asset, but it's competing with the US dollar and depends very much what the interest rate is on the US dollar, whether you can sustain your own national safe asset or not. And then gold would be another competing uh, asset as a potential safe asset. Of course, it's always people have to coordinate on it and say we use gold as our safe asset. Okay, great. Thanks so much uh, to Marcus and Stan and all the attendees, uh, all the participants, no, all the like attendees, yes. So, uh, Philip, uh, you're going to have the uh, floor for next half hour. Please go ahead. Okay. I hope you can see my slides now. Uh, yeah, now it's great. Okay, perfect. So, uh, thanks a lot to the organizers for having us as part of this uh, conference. Um, so, uh, the title of the paper is The Financial Origins of the Rise and Fall of American Inflation. And this is joint work with my frequent co authors, uh, Ethan Drexler and Alexis Savo. So, um, what this paper does, it, it sort of revisits uh, a period which we think is very important, the period of the Great Inflation, which is usually dated from 1965 to uh, 1982. And, and we would argue this, this period was very influential, in fact, formative for a lot of uh, macroeconomics uh, and uh, you know, in particular for, for monetary economics. Uh, and the reason why it's so important is because you know, it's a time when inflation got out of control despite very high interest rates, uh, the Fed raising interest rates to up to 20%. It's also a period where arguably there was sort of a crisis of understanding. So the old Keynesian toolbox sort of stopped working 
Uh, we saw high inflation and high unemployment, uh, something we call stagflation. And so uh, both academics and policymakers didn't quite know what was going on uh, during that time. Now, I think it's fair to say that there's been a giant literature on this topic. And so it's very hard to summarize it in one slide. I think actually Raghu did a wonderful job sort of you know, uh, summarizing it earlier. Uh, I'll, I will do an attempt here. Basically, one way to think about it is sort of a standard narrative which emerged out of that is, is uh, which, uh, which blamed the Fed for uh, the rise of inflation. Um, and the intuition is that basically that the Fed didn't raise uh, interest rates aggressively enough. And, and one way this was sort of formalized is in two papers by Clarita Gall and Gertler, uh, building on earlier work by Taylor, is just saying that the, the Fed didn't raise interest rate more than one for one with expected inflation. And so the real rate was actually going down. And so it wasn't stopping inflation. And so uh, in a sense, the Fed lost credibility uh, because people were expecting inflation because the Fed wasn't stepping in, uh, inflation uh, actually happened. And, and so you had a self-fulfilling equilibrium. So uh, under this narrative, and, and I think it goes according to the popular narrative, what ended this, it ended you know, by Paul Volcker coming in. He restored Fed credibility. He raised rates, kept them high, despite uh, inciting a very severe recession in the early 80s, kept them there until inflation was coming down. Um, and since then, we have seen uh, lower levels of inflation, less volatile inflation, also longer expansions of the business cycle, uh, something which we call the great moderation. I think a lot of people, as Raghu suggested, think that this is due to the fact that the Fed had learned its lesson and, and got better at implementing monetary policy. So arguably, this, this sort of credibility view underlies monetary policy theory and practice up to today. Let me just show you two figures uh, which are going to make this point, uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page. So uh, what I'm showing you here is just sort of Fed funds rate and CPI inflation that's annual over the following year, uh, starting in the early 60s. And you see sort of in the 60s, inflation was, was really low, around 2%, just where we are today. Uh, and then it started rising uh, in 1965. So uh, the economy was really hot at the time. There was the buildup to the Vietnam War. And then you can sort of see inflation rising over the next uh, 17 years. And there are these three cycles, uh, but the high of each cycle is higher than previously, and the trough uh, is also higher. Uh, and then Volcker came in uh, in uh, 1980 and, and sort of restored credibility uh, by raising interest rates, and you see uh, inflation coming down. Uh, the other important aspect is, is the stagflation. So there's the stack part, uh, namely that uh, real economic activity was declining every time uh, inflation uh, was going up. So it's easy to see sort of the negative correlation between inflation and uh, GDP growth. And that sort of contradicted the Phillips curve, uh, which was the way a lot of people were thinking about it at the time. And, and as I want to point out, GDP was very volatile. So you had four recessions over a, a relatively short time period. So what is this paper about? So um, we, we argue, propose, uh, and, and test uh, what we think of as possibly an alternative explanation for the great inflation. And um, you know, the way we think about it is it's really financial repression. So um, we focus on the US, but inflation was rampant uh, across the world, uh, not just in the US. There was some interesting uh, variation across countries. I'm going to come back to that. But for the most part, most countries had some form of financial repression. It took different forms in different countries. And so uh, to really dig in, we're gonna focus on the US, uh, but if there's any interest, I have more to say about other countries uh, during the Q&A. So in the US, financial repression, we argue, took the form of uh, an important law, namely Regulation Q, which was imposed and then later repealed. So what's Regulation Q? It's, it's a law which places hot uh, feelings on normal deposit rates. So we argue that at the time, uh, maybe even today, deposits were the main form of liquid savings for, for most households, but not all, which is going to be important. Uh, so for most households, a large fraction of them, regulation to suppress the return to saving, and it also disabled the transmission of monetary policy to households. So as the Fed funds rate was increasing, it, it wasn't passed through to depositors. So let me show you what that means in the picture here in black, I'm just adding this ceiling rate. This is for savings deposits, but there was a slightly higher ceiling rate for time deposits and then checking deposits. We also uh, had a ceiling, which was zero at the time. And so savings deposits are plotted here because that was the main form uh, of savings uh, of deposits at the time. And so in 1965, uh, the, the Fed decided 
to let that bind. So regulation Q had been around uh, before that, but they made a conscious decision to let it bind. Uh, I can talk more about why they did that. Our reading, our understanding of the literature is they actually thought it would reduce inflation. So there was a sense in which, well, Regulation Q, uh, you know, going to limit uh, the the increase in deposits that I will show you. So that's going to limit money growth, and that should reduce inflation. Uh, but importantly, then after that, there was no pass through of the Fed funds rate to the deposit rates. So uh, what did that mean for the real deposit rate? So that's now what you have sort of in, in yellow, uh, beige. Uh, basically, real deposit rate was plus two percent uh, in the early '60s. And it went down all the way to minus 8% uh, by 1979. And I should say, in contrast, you know, the, the literature has focused uh, mainly that the, the real Fed funds rate uh, was too low. So that's the difference between uh, the red line and the blue line. So if you think zero was too low at the time, then minus 8% is definitely too low. Uh, and if you want to think about the cost, uh, not the welfare cost, but the cost to depositors, uh, one way to get it back of the envelope uh, magnitude is to just sort of take the change in the real deposit rate. So that's minus eight, this is eight percent, and then multiply it, uh, you know, by the amount of deposit, and we scale it by consumption. If you want to think about the deposit as how much did they have to pay to hold these deposits, it's roughly four percent of consumption. So that that's big. That's the the magnitude of a recession. You have to pay that effectively every every year. So how would that? Um, you know, cause inflation. So, so the idea is the following. So uh, once you suppress the return to saving, you have a great incentive to spend. So aggregate demand is going up. That's going to put an upward pressure on prices and going to lead to high inflation. Um, now that can accelerate in the sense that once you have high inflation, it's going to lower the deposit rate. It's going to increase aggregate demand even further and therefore increases inflation even further. So the intuition is actually not new. It's very similar to the normal rate pack, which Milton Friedman described in his famous presidential address in 1968, is just here we're sort of pegging the deposit rate, uh, not, not the Fed funds rate, and it's regulation Q, which, which is pegging the rate. Now, how does it play uh, the stack part? Uh, why did output go down? So that's sort of the second piece here, how a financial friction like regulation Q could potentially cause a decline in output. So the idea is you have this low deposit rate, uh, but you have deposit outflows. So, you know, uh, this addresses possibly Raghu's uh, first point where he said, well, where did the money go? So the idea we have is that there's sort of a set of depositors which are, you know, inattentive, maybe less sophisticated, maybe they really value deposit insurance. So those are the ones which are stuck uh, in the financial system. So those are the ones who sort of kind of push up aggregate demand. But the other depositors who want to get out, and so they're going to put their money into other assets. Uh, at the time, we think you know a lot of it went into housing. Uh, it also went into treasury, some of it in the stock market. But the important point here is that banks lose funding because deposits are flowing out. So it leads to a disintermediation of the banking sector. And if the banking sector can't get funds elsewhere, uh, you end up with a credit crunch. And so bank dependent firms going to be constrained. And so output going to fall and unemployment going to rise. You can think about it as sort of the aggregate supply curve uh, shifting inwards. So let me show you some aggregate evidence on the deposit. So here, what I'm plotting is real deposit growth and real bank asset growth. Uh, and what you can see is every time inflation uh, went up, basically deposit growth uh, declined. So if you know our earlier work on the deposit channel, uh, that's basically the deposit channel on, on steroids. Uh, and you can see sort of starts right uh, when they, you know, basically made regulation Q binding. So the first time this happened was in 1966. Uh, and that's actually where the, the term credit crunch comes from. That's the first time uh, people used that in the literature. And you can also see that banks didn't really have the ability to substitute to other sources of funding. So asset growth and deposit growth went hand in hand. So I should say, you know, uh, something like the euro dollar market developed right around the time, same with money market funds. They were very small. We think of them as actually as a reaction to regulation Q. Uh, so that's what you get when you have a big friction, but they weren't large enough in order to, uh, you know, offset this effect. So arguably today it might be different where you have a bigger shadow banking system, but at the time the banking system was really uh, central. Um, and so just to show you that lines up with, uh, you know, output growth. So you had high inflation, uh, a low real deposit rate, you had the deposit outflows. And so that's exactly when uh, GDP growth uh, went down. Now, one uh, interesting aspect is, um, you know, how did it all stop? Uh, so what ended the great inflation? So it turns out regulation Q was effectively repealed in uh, the late 70s. Uh, 
And the way they did it is they didn't just get rid of Regulation Q. Instead, what they did is they introduced new deregulated deposit accounts. And so um, the rates on these new accounts immediately shot up far above the old ceilings. And importantly, households actively took the money out of the old accounts and put them into the new accounts. So in today's terms, we see you know, 3.5 trillion of deposits moving from the old to the new accounts in roughly a year, year and a half. Uh, so arguably that's sort of another uh, point that was the fact that this regulation really was binding. Once it was removed, uh, you know, that, that reduced incentive to spend uh, and there was less pressure uh, on, on prices. And uh, I show you here in the picture, uh, basically in black, uh, you have two lines jumping up. The reason is there's sort of two accounts were introduced. Uh, first one were money market certificates in 1978, uh, the third quarter, and then a year later, small saver certificates. And, and you kind of see the jump up in the deposit rates and the past was restored in the sense that the black line then co-moves with uh, the Fed funds rate, the, the blue one. And if you want to think about it in terms of the real deposit rate, which I emphasized beforehand, uh, basically what you find is that it went from minus 8% to 0% in 80 and, and plus 4% in, in 81. Uh, and, you know, in terms of the timing, I think in the, uh, in the time series, obviously very hard to disentangle these things. That's, as I'll show you later, we'll go to the cross section, but it sort of happened around the same time as, as uh, uh, Volcker raised the uh, interest rate. Uh, one uh, thing which came up in Raghu's discussion uh, early on as well is like, what does it mean for savings? Um, so the one thing we have done actually, and I, I don't know whether it addresses this point, it's not in the paper yet, but you know, when you think about savings, you think about you know, uh, trading of consumption today versus tomorrow, so you think about the Euler equation. And you know, people have looked at this evidence, uh, in particular, I think of a paper by Campbell Mank, you haven't found uh, you know, uh, that the Euler equation doesn't seem to hold basically, that's, that's what they found. Now, if you replace uh, the real Fed funds rate, that's what people use in the literature, the difference between the blue and the red line, with the real deposit rate, then actually it looks like the oil equation holds reasonably well. So you get an applied EIS uh, of around one. Uh, and so consumption growth is really highly correlated with the, the real deposit rate. So in terms of trading off consumption today versus trading off consumption tomorrow, we think uh, this is actually consistent to, uh, with the idea that households actually responded uh, to the change in interest rate. Okay, so what I wanna do in the, the rest of the talk is I wanna give you a bit of a sense of, you know, is it possible that there's a causal mechanism going from regulation Q to inflation? So what I will do is I, I will sort of pull out the tools of applied micro uh, and show you some natural experiments uh, which potentially address that question. Uh, before I do that, just to give you a little bit more history of, of where did regulation Q you come from is it actually came from 1933. It was a, it's a very sensible idea. Basically, uh, it was there to prevent excess competition. So if you had a risky banks, which were sort of gambling for resurrection and offered very high deposit rates, sort of regulation Q was supposed to take care of that. And so the way it was implemented, it wasn't really binding for, for most banks. It just sort of took off uh, the top of the banks, which offered very high deposit rates. And then in 65, there was a decision to, to change this, to actually let it bind, but not raising it as I had done previously uh, with the idea that gonna slow money growth and credit growth. So our understanding uh, based on the reading of the literature is they thought that actually gonna reduce inflation. Uh, and again, this sort of was similar in other countries. So in the UK, you had the so-called corset system, which you know the idea was it really was strangling uh, the intermediation sector. Uh, so this was something which was uh, quite widespread, not, not just in the US. Okay, so uh, what are we gonna do in the cross section? So we would say the aggregate time series is at least sort of consistent with the idea that Revelation Q uh, may have uh, contributed to the great inflation. So now we're gonna look at cross section variation exposure to Revelation Q uh, and, and look at its effect uh, on inflation. Uh, and the reason why we do that as always, we think we can potentially control for aggregate economic condition and, and that you know, may help us to sort of uh, control for alternative explanations uh, such as Fed credibility. Now, the identification challenge here, I think, is, is pretty clear. Uh, you may be worried that variation exposure to regulation Q uh, and inflation may just be responding to other local economic uh, conditions. So that's the immediate variable. You may also think that regulation Q just going to respond to expected variation in inflation. So, what we have done to try to address that is we sort of looked at four natural experiments covering the rise and the fall of uh, great inflation. 
So uh, in the interest of time, I, I sort of gonna focus on the first three. Uh, the fourth one uh, is, is in the paper if you're interested. So uh, I should tell you what, what data are we using to do this? So you need data on deposits and inflation. So the deposit data, we effectively use bank call reports. Uh, the, the, you know, the chunk of the work here was sort of uh, uh, extending the, the call reports to go back in time. Um, so we got the data from the Federal Reserve and a lot of work went into sort of setting them up. Uh, but that's, that's what we're using here. We also use data on the SNLs, uh, uh, basically the financial reports. This is the equivalent of call reports, uh, but for the SNLs, the reason you have to do that is SNLs were pretty large at that time, roughly a third of the financial system. And they had a different regulator uh, and so therefore we had to collect them uh, from a different data source. Now, in terms of inflation, we're gonna use uh, two measures of inflation. One is CPI inflation. So that comes from the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, and that covers the 25 largest MSAs. And uh, to extend our sample, we're also gonna look at wage inflation. So we basically look at normal wage growth and we have two different services, one covering all private sector employees and one covering manufacturing employees. They start a little bit later, but then have uh, broader uh, coverage. Now, uh, Raghu has raised the point of, you know, do we really expect to see variation inflation, you know, within the US? So if you have a monetary union, everything is tradable, you would think that there shouldn't be any difference in inflation. Now, exactly as he actually suggested, if you have non-tradables, you may see, uh, you know, that there is a variation in inflation. And I think that's exactly what we see in the data. Uh, I think it's also what you see in Europe within the monetary union. But obviously these might be temporary. So to the extent that they're temporary deviations, I think we would potentially underestimate uh, the effects, but we can come back to that uh, later. Okay, so uh, the first uh, experiment is sort of at the onset of uh, the um, you know, uh, great inflation. So as I said before, Regulation Q became binding for banks in 1965. Um, now, interestingly, SNLs initially were exempted because they had this different regulator. It was the Federal Home Loan Bank Board, not the Fed regulating them. So it took them a year and a half to sort of uh, follow uh, the Fed. And so for this brief period, basically, Regulation Q was arguably less binding in areas which were dominated by SNLs. So uh, according to our theory, you know, these areas uh, should pay more competitive rates and therefore see less of an inflation increase. Uh, so that's what we're going to look at. The identification assumption here is that the SNL share is predetermined and, and not picking up other factors uh, driving inflation during the onset of the great inflation, uh, which we think is, is plausible. So here uh, you have it in terms of a picture. The table is in the paper, but basically in terms of the picture, what we do is we just run a bunch of uh, cross-sectional regressions where we regress inflation on the uh, SNL share. And you know, what you see is basically there's no difference between areas which had a lot of SNLs versus areas which do not uh, before 65. So there's no pre-trend in any way. Uh, once the regulation became binding on uh, the commercial banks, basically what you see is that the SNL dominated areas had a smaller increase in inflation. So that's what it means to have this negative coefficient. And then this sort of disappears once the SNL become subject uh, to regulation queue. So we think that sort of the dynamics of this effect are very much consistent with the idea that uh, the limited pass through of uh, you know, the Fed funds rate, the deposit rates for the commercial banks during this time, but not that the SNLs can explain uh, the inflation. In terms of the magnitude, I would say that the coefficient sort of consistent with the, the kind of aggregate increase we saw during that time, which was, was roughly 3%. It was just the start of, of the great inflation. Okay, now that brings me to my second experiment. Uh, let me see right away. I think the second experiment is actually sort of the most well identified one. It's not economically the most important one, uh, but still we think is actually um, a setting where we have a very nice natural experiment. So uh, we call this a now account experiment. I should say that's not our name. Uh, that's the name uh, which you got in the literature in the seventies uh, at a time when they didn't really think much about natural experiments anyway. Uh, so so uh, what, is, what is the experiment? So the story goes as follows. In 1972, there was a small bank in Worcester, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. Uh, and that bank created a now account. Um, so what's a now account? It's basically a checking account which pays interest. Uh, that violates Regulation Q. But this bank thought like, well, maybe we can get around it. So rather than paying 0% uh, on checking, which you had to do under Regulation Q, they decided to pay the rate on savings deposits. It technically, it was a savings deposit. So they paid 5%, which was the ceiling rate on savings deposits at the time. 
Now, not surprisingly, other banks did not like that. They said it was unfair and immediately sued for unfair competition because it violated Regulation Q. Now, um, this uh, uh, lawsuit basically made its way for the courts very quickly. And in a surprise move, the Massachusetts Supreme Court actually authorized now accounts, but only for state chartered banks with the logic that the state chartered banks are not subject to Regulation Q, only the federally chartered banks. Now, most commercial banks were federally chartered, so what they did is now they went to DC and asked Congress uh, whether they could also offer now accounts. And so the experiment here is in 1974, Congress offers now accounts, but only for Massachusetts. Um, they threw in New Hampshire as well because the Boston metro area overlaps with New Hampshire. So you can't really sort of separate in Massachusetts and New Hampshire in terms of banking, but only for those two states, uh, they allowed uh, these now accounts. And it was hugely popular. So within a couple of uh, years, basically Massachusetts, 80% of households took up this now account. And so over time, you had a staggered rollout because uh, basically in other states, especially in border towns, banks felt again, this was unfair competition. So they started lobbying Congress to have this exemption as well. So I can show you that in terms of a map. So here, this is sort of a map of the Northeast. And you kind of see here basically in blue, you have uh, New Hampshire and Massachusetts. Uh, so that's why it was authorized in 74. And, and the red dots, uh, you know, where we have data. Uh, so these are MSAs. And so what you see is that basically, you know, the competition with other New England states was, uh, you know, where basically it was first authorized. So in 1976, it was expanded to the rest of uh, New England. Uh, after that, it was expanded to New York uh, and then New Jersey. And, uh, you know, finally in 1980, uh, basically it was expanded to the rest of the US. So what we're gonna do is basically think of this as a partial repeal of Regulation Q. Um, it was just partial because it didn't reestablish the transmission. It also just sort of affected checking versus uh, savings, but still uh, we think it's well identified. So we just use sort of the standard identification design uh, for a staggered rollout. So we're gonna regress inflation in you know, MSAI uh, at time T on an MSA fixed effect, time fixed effect. And then we have the dummy variable deregulate, which turns on uh, if an MSA actually allows now accounts. Uh, and so the identification assumption is that this rollout was driven by this geographic proximity to uh, Massachusetts, not by expected local inflation or economic activity uh, in those areas. So here again, sort of the result is in terms of uh, picture, basically what you see is that when this regulation came in, Massachusetts and New Hampshire relative to the other states saw uh, much lower inflation. So it seemed to come in pretty quickly. Then when it was expanded to the rest of New England, so that's when Connecticut, Maine, Rhode Island, Vermont came in, uh, you know, they switched basically from being control states to treatment states, you still see a negative coefficient. Coefficient is smaller, uh, arguably because, you know, literature argued at the time that, you know, there was less competition there, so it was a little bit less taken, but it's still negative. Uh, and you see the same effect with New York and New Jersey. And then, you know, in 1980, everybody comes in at which point you can't identify. Um, uh, Bill, if I wanted to jump in here with the question, yes. if you can. Um, could you, so uh, this way of plotting things I think is reasonable, but it seems like you could also do this in sort of just a pre post deregulation and pull all of the things, which would let you look at pre trends. I mean, I think the identification is probably plausible, but is there a reason you don't do things that way? Um, so, I think I know what you mean, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, if you Basically just do it as like an event study, you know, where you, you're you in one group before deregulation and you're in the other group after deregulation, and then you just look at before and after. Um, I, I would be happy to do that. We haven't haven't really plotted it that way. We okay. thought that was uh, one way to show it graphically, but I think uh, I would be happy to do it the way uh, you suggest. I mean, what, what we have done so far is, you know, in the table, basically, uh, which I'm putting up here, is uh, you know we, we, we did it for all measures of inflation which we have at that time. And so we did look at it uh, at CPI inflation, uh, at wage inflation uh, using basically all employees and then at wage inflation uh, using just manufacturing. Um, so what we liked about this is basically that you find a similar coefficient uh, for you know, all of these different inflation measures. Uh, and the one thing we have done is, you know, in columns two, four, and six, we, we also control for uh, economic conditions. So if you're worried that we're just picking up economic conditions, uh, that's not the case. You find the economic conditions are actually uh, significant, so the, the, you know, uh, 
the common, they, they have explanatory value for inflation, but they don't affect uh, the coefficient uh, of, of interest. Right? Mm -hmm. but, but thanks for your, your comment, I, I think. We, yeah, I mean, I think the point, the broader point is just like, you know, trying to assess parallel pre-trends in some sense. And then on, on this slide, I had like a related question, which is, I mean, so you have MSA fixed effects here, but it would be nice to like show comparisons like on observables for these things, um, really for all these specifications where you're sort of comparing an implicit like treatment and control group just to show that they're similar on observables. Yeah, so that's not in the paper yet. So I think that's another good point. So we're all happy to, to add that. Um, Okay, so this was my second experiment. Um, now I want to get to my third experiment. So um, this experiment, uh, I should say, we think is economically the most important one. Uh, potentially, you know, it's a little bit less well identified than the last one. Uh, but let me tell you why I think it's important. So this is sort of getting back to the aggregate graph where we looked at the deregulation uh, of, uh, um, you know, the, the introduction of these two deregulated, deregulated accounts, money market certificates and small saver certificates. And, and those were most similar to small time deposits, I should say, it's most similar to CD. Uh, what we want to do is examine the impact of uh, the local take up of these uh, deregulated deposits on inflation. Now here, I think the identification challenge is, is very clear. You may be worried that, you know, if you see an MSA taking up more of these, uh, you know, small time deposits, these new accounts, maybe it's something about that they're responding to local economic conditions or they're responding to, to expected inflation. So the one thing we can do uh, is we can actually instrument for the take up. Um, so what we're doing here is, you know, we are basically exploiting the fact that these two new regulated accounts were, were similar to, to small time deposits. So, so arguably checking savings time deposits differ in the maturity and the liquidity, the sort of imperfect substitutes. And so the take up should be larger in places where you already had more small time deposits. Now, we don't explain this like the variation small time deposits, but the one thing I should say is we measured as 1975. And so at that time, economic conditions were quite different from 1978 to so the extent that you're bored it's just picking up economic conditions. Uh, you know, I think measuring as of 1975 uh, somewhat addresses that. Um, now this is the OLS, let me just skip that. It's large, but potentially endogenous. And so uh, if you do the IV, this is sort of the first stage. There's a bin scatter plot. So we have more than 300 MSAs. So, you know, each bin here is roughly 15 MSAs. And what you can see is that if a metro area basically had uh, you know, more small time deposits in 1975, that predicted whether it, you know, took up more of these deregulated accounts uh, early on. Uh, and so that's what we're gonna use in these regressions. We basically uh, instrument for the MMC share uh, with uh, the, uh, you know, 1975 uh, small time deposit share uh, and we find uh, a relatively large coefficient. We also control for past inflation. They might be worried that we're just picking up uh, regression to the mean, maybe, you know, some uh, areas just sort of have a higher beta with respect to, to aggregate inflation, uh, but that doesn't seem to be the case uh, because we can control for it and it doesn't affect the coefficient of interest. So uh, the magnitude of that is sort of consistent, I should, I should say it's consistent with, with the drop in, in aggregate inflation uh, which we observed uh, during that time. Obviously there could be other things going on, but if you want to interpret the economic magnitude, it's actually uh, quite large. Um, now, uh, there's also uh, evidence on the timing here. Uh, so you can look, uh, you know, when did that actually happen? Uh, the point is that, you know, cross-sectionally inflation really started to decline in sort of the exposed areas right when, uh, you know, these deregulated accounts came in, even though aggregate inflation was still uh, increasing at the time. So that's consistent with uh, these deregulated accounts really having an effect uh, on inflation. Now, uh, one other piece of evidence that's not in the paper yet is on the international dimension. So I just wanted to say one word on that because uh, you know we look within the US, but obviously another way we want to look at it is across countries. So as I said before, a lot of countries had inflation, but the one country which had relatively low inflation is actually Germany. And so here I'm plotting inflation, uh, the local equivalent of the Fed funds rate uh, and uh, the uh, you know, deposit rate uh, on this graph. Uh, and the one thing which is interesting is people had written papers about the fact that, you know, in some sense, inflation never got that high in Germany. So there's a famous paper which sort of says Germany was opting out of the great inflation. Uh, and uh, in terms of our explanation, you would be wondering, well, why did Germany have less inflation than the other countries? So it's interesting, uh, 
Germany actually eliminated the equivalent of regulation Q in 1967. So uh, they got rid of it. And what you see in terms of deposit rates is they were much more sensitive to the short rate. So this kind of um, you know, lack of transmission mechanism wasn't happening in Germany. So I think at least that evidence is, is consistent uh, with what we are seeing. Now, a lot of other countries had uh, inflation, uh, which was very high, like the UK and other countries. And we're sort of looking into those uh, you know, in more detail. So far, we have done Germany and the UK. They seem to be consistent with, with our explanation, as far as we can tell. Okay, so, so let me uh, summarize. So the paper is sort of arguing that financial repression played a big role. And the way it played out in the US was uh, with regulation Q, which disabled the monetary policy transmission. Um, so, you know, basically we argue if serious financial friction, uh, not necessarily the Fed's policy rule was to blame. And so once the friction was removed, inflation sort of returned to, to low levels. And um, in terms of the stagflation part, as I argued before, uh, you know, the credit crunches potentially can explain why that happened when inflation went up. Now, it's a historical paper, but we think if you um, take the results at face value, it has implications beyond that particular period. So let me just sort of like, you know, mention two possibly. So the first one is, um, you know, if the low inflation after, you know, 1982 is not just due to aggressive monetary policy, as conventional belief, you know, you may be less worried about the fact that, you know, being less aggressive is going to lead to more inflation. So, you know, a number of people have argued since 2008 that, you know, inflation is just around the corner and often it's sort of invoking the uh, experience of the 70s. But, um, you know, you might be less worried about losing your credibility if it's not that central to begin with. So that may be explaining why, you know, inflation is not just around the corner. And it affects policy decision on the margin, at least you know, our reading in 2015, this idea that inflation might uh, flay up again uh, was sort of you know, part of the responsible effect to raise. It's also obviously an issue which came up uh, when Chip Powell recently uh, announced uh, that they wanna to move to average inflation uh, target. Uh, so that's one aspect of how that plays out today. The other one, and this sort of uh, builds on what uh, Raghu said earlier, um, you know, potentially this can reconcile what we see at the zero lower bound with what we have seen in the 70s. So the idea is quite simple. So regulation Q uh, effectively put a ceiling on deposit rates and we argue that led to high inflation. Now, one way to think about the CLP is basically puts a floor on deposit rate, at least retail deposit rates have a hard time going below zero. And so if you have a floor that potentially can lead to low inflation. So, um, you know, possibly this sort of explanation, this framework can help us think both about the 70s, but also about uh, what's going on uh, right now. Thank you. Um, okay, great. Thanks so much, Philip, for being so on time. Uh, so, uh, uh, Joe, uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me to to discuss this paper. Um, so let me start out just very briefly summarizing it, um, which probably isn't necessary since that presentation I think was was quite clear. So the argument of the paper basically is that regulation Q prevented banks from uh, raising rates. Um, and as a result, it then prevented the pass through of the federal funds rate to households and then kind of as a implication of that then caused the great inflation. Um, in more detail, basically, even though the federal funds rate rose substantially in the late 70s, uh, the effective rate stayed low um, or actually was declining as inflation took off um, or the, the real rate. So, um, so you had this inflationary spiral as a result of this, this rate cap. Then inflation ended when regulation Q ended and the pass through of the federal funds rate was, was restored. Um, so in the paper, I think even a little more than in the, in the talk today, uh, it emphasizes a lot that the end of regulation Q and the peak of inflation was three quarters before the Volcker rate hike. So kind of suggesting that it wasn't Volcker raising rates, kind of the traditional story driving the end of the great inflation and was instead uh, the end of, of regulation Q. Um, and then there's a bunch of cross-sectional evidence. Um, that's kind of the bulk of the paper showing that locations where regulation Q was binding uh, saw smaller local inflation. So for example, like high uh, SNL shares are associated with, with lower local inflation rates. 
Um, so I think what I'm what I'm going to do is kind of um, uh, talk through and mostly on the measurement side of this rather than thinking about the the mechanisms. So I think in sort of the big picture, I think this is an intriguing idea. Um, it's a pretty bold claim in some sense that the con conventional wisdom is wrong, you know, or maybe that that's too strong of a statement. I guess it doesn't necessarily need to, to be that the conventional wisdom is wrong, you know, but at least incomplete. I mean, both of these things could be important um, in practice. And I would say I'm definitely broadly sympathetic to the idea that thinking about financial frictions and kind of institutional details matter for, for monetary transmission. You know, so less on the deposit side, but more thinking about borrower behavior. Um, you know, a lot of my own work recently has been focused on exactly thinking about those kind of frictions, but on the, on the mortgage market side. Um, but what I want to talk through is that I, I think I do have some concerns, um, especially in kind of the aggregate time series, uh, kind of thinking about the underlying data and the extent to which some of the correlation patterns kind of hold up um, potentially with, with alternative data series. Um, so, um, so yeah, so, so first kind of just showing the, the aggregate time, uh, time series here. I think I'm doing this at a slightly higher frequency than, than what they are in the paper. So there's a little bit more high frequency variation, but this is just showing in black the CPI inflation rate um, against the, the federal funds rate. And so um, essentially, you know, one of the points they're emphasizing is that the inflation rate is basically peaking here, you know, roughly a year before uh, the federal funds rate peaks. And this is kind of around when regulation Q ends here. So as, as sort of the evidence for, or at least suggestive evidence that the repeal of regulation Q was actually what was ending the, the great inflation. Um, so um, I just want to sort of go through a number of potential issues uh, with just the, the CPI measurement and see the extent to which different sort of data sort of methodology considerations um, affect the, the sort of patterns of inflation here. Um, so one thing I think it's important to note is that the, the main CPI series, which I think is what they're using in this series, sort of the headline CPI, is not updated across time as methodology, as methodology has changed. Um, so I would say the old methodology, I mean, bad is maybe too strong of a word, but I think like it ha was problematic in some dimensions uh, that, that might be important for this period. So for example, until 1983, the shelter component of CPI directly included house prices, and it also included mortgage interest rates. Um, so one reason that might be important is there was a very large spike and decline in mortgage rates in 1980 uh, quarter one. Um, so my first suggestion about kind of a methodological change is to switch from the headline CPI to using um, what I think they now call the CPI retroactive series, or in the past it's been called the CPI research series. But it's basically sort of redoing the historical CPI, but using the current methodology retroactively. So it's sort of a CPI series with consistent methodology across time. Um, so this shows the effect of switching to that series. Uh, just that change alone doesn't make like a huge difference for things. It basically, um, you still get the result that inflation still peaks before the federal funds rate peaks. Um, but that kind of leading thing, I think, is, is a good amount more muted. So, you know, it's not sort of this huge spike here and then rapid decline. It's kind of more of a, a plateau in some sense. Um, so, so that's the, the sort of first change that I would suggest. Um, the second is, is noting that uh, there is another like sort of what I would think of as kind of like idiosyncratic thing going on, you know, right at the beginning of right at the end of 1979, beginning of 1980. And that's that we had the Iranian revolution and this gigantic oil price spike. So this is basically a huge transitory increase in oil prices um, and then a huge decline in, in oil prices. So in light of that, I mean, I, I guess it's debatable, you know, exactly what CPI series you want to be looking at, but I think it's useful to um, look at what's happening, what's happening to core inflation. And when you do that, if you look at sort of core CPI using this consistent methodology across time, that actually then does make a pretty big difference for these timing things. Um, so then it really pushes back the peak of, of inflation, you know, by a by a solid year or so. And it's it, at least to me looks much more like the sort of uh, traditional Volcker narrative where you have the inflation rate basically peaking around the time that uh, that the federal funds rate peaks. Um, so this is with that retroactive core CPI. I was sort of Curious, you know, if you look at other inflation measures, the extent to which these things kind of look like, you know, one or the other of these CPIs. 
Um, here's looking at things with the GDP deflator. If you do that, I think again, it sort of looks like this, you know, peak is relatively later than using the, the headline CPI inflation rate. Um, and we don't have like great measures of wage inflation that, you know, don't have sort of composition concerns in the background, but we can just look at, for example, average hourly wages. And again, those have a lot of composition problems. But if you look at sort of the peak of wage inflation, it's also on the, on the later end there. Um, so to me, I, I think these inflation patterns suggest more like the traditional narrative and not that inflation peaked before the Volcker rate hikes. Um, you know, but I don't want to lean too much in the paper, you know, has caveats on this dimension too. you know, on interpreting a few quarter aggregate time series difference. Uh, there are, you know, lots of confounding things and it's hard to interpret high frequency time series stuff. So most of the paper, I think, is rightly devoted to cross section evidence, looking at how local inflation is related to how binding regulation Q is, is locally. Um, so I think this is all nice and, and well executed. Um, but keeping in sort of the similar spirit of thinking about the underlying data measurement. Um, I do have a concern about what I think is the primary local inflation measure they're using. It wasn't totally clear to me. So another suggestion I have is just being a little more, more clear on that. Um, so let me talk through that. But with noting up front that several specifications in the paper look at wage growth, um, I don't think that's subject to this concern. So I'm this isn't kind of a concern with all the results. And it's also something that I think should be relatively easy to address with um, a pretty simple robustness check. So I think the CPI inflation measure they're using is, is the total CPI from these 25 cities that the BLS publishes it for, um, but using the component that, in, that includes the shelter component. Um, so if you're doing that, um, I think it's important to note that, that that sort of all prices CPI with shelter in there um, the cross-sectional variation that, in that is mostly driven by local house price growth. So like here is looking at the, um, the all item inflation rate, the correlation with the local inflation rate after excluding shelter, basically residualizing with year fixed effects. So you, you know, there is still a positive correlation, but there's not a very tight relationship between the all items inflation rate and the inflation rate excluding the housing component. If you look at the relationship between the all items inflation rate and just the shelter component, you know, there's a much tighter relationship there. So, so what does that mean in, in practice? It's, it's basically saying that if that's the inflation rate they're using, these regressions are closer to a regression of local house price growth on savings and loan shares. Um, so I know very little about savings and loan variation, but just kind of reading the description that's in the paper they, about the identification assumption, they said our understanding is that SNL variation is driven by long run variation in local housing markets. SNLs are focused on residential mortgage provision and higher average levels of housing activity naturally translate into higher uh, SL shares in deposit markets. From the identification perspective, there's no reason to believe that this variation is driven by local housing markets is correlated with inflation during the analysis period. Um, so if, it, if what this regression is basically doing is a regression of like local housing characteristics or funding on local housing price growth, I'm not so sure that argument is, is that compelling, but I would basically just suggest, I mean, I think this is relatively easy to deal with by just uh, redoing the specifications, but using you know the local non-shelter CPI um, or, or even better, um, using this uh, recent series that was just put out by uh, Hazel, Hereno, Nakamura, and Steinson, where they constructed state level CPI series back to 1978. That'll exclude some of your specifications, but I think some of them uh, you, can, you can still use. Um, and then that, that's sort of the, like my main comment. One other question that I had about sort of the big picture narrative of the paper is you focus a lot on kind of the savings rate, you know, the, the deposit rate and the implications for savings. Uh, but the paper has very little discussion of the of the borrowing rate. Um, so this is just a question I had that I mean, regulation Q shouldn't, for example, reduce transmission of the federal funds rate to mortgage rates or bank business loans, should it? So couldn't we still have transmission effects kind of on the on the borrower side? Um, so summarizing, I think it's a, a provocative and, and impressive paper. Um, I kind of in the end, I don't really find the aggregate time series evidence against the standard narrative all that persuasive once you use what I think is arguably a corrected inflation series. But multiple things can be 
going on at once in the world. And I think most of the paper is the cross-sectional patterns and I do find those more compelling. But I think, you know, you should make sure that you're not just picking up a relationship between sort of housing finance and, and house price growth. So I would, you know, suggest looking a little bit more into that. Um, okay, great. Thanks so much, Joe. Uh, so to all the attendees, uh, please, if you have any questions, uh, raise your hands in the chat. And Philip, if you want to answer some of the concerns that Joe raised, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Okay, well, thanks a lot for this uh, discussion. I really appreciate these comments. I'm going to try to be uh, short, uh, but I want to respond quickly. So we have looked at these other measures of inflation. The reason why we didn't plot it in the paper is because they don't go back to 1965. But, you know, we could do plots similar to what we have done. The literature has looked at that. So Alan Blind has a paper in 1980 where he says, yeah, it looks a bit smaller if you, uh, you know, correct for the way they, they treated housing, but it doesn't change the, you know, the fact that there was the great inflation. The other thing is about the oil shocks. In some sense, you know, the oil shocks are very important, but uh, I'm going to be brief. I mean, the literature has sort of concluded that, you know, they can't really explain, you know, the one-time shock cannot explain the persistence of inflation over this long period. And in some sense, as you said, you know, you need the narrative of Volcker, but if it's just a bunch of bad shocks, the bad luck theory, that's what it's called in the literature, then, you know, you wouldn't need Volcker, it's just, you know, the bad shocks have to go away. So in some sense, I think the, the predominant narrative is that you had supply shocks, uh, so they were important, but then monetary policy wasn't sort of, you know, uh, aggressive enough in beating down inflation once you had the shocks. And so in some sense, the supply shocks are there, they're important, and we could take them out. But I think, you know, what we are sort of responding to is sort of the narrative that it was just monetary policy, uh, which made uh, the thing much worse. Yeah, I get that. I more just meant like the exact timing, I think sort of seems sensitive to the oil price. I, I think, you know, maybe we, uh, there was, um, I, my point I want to make is sort of happening around the same time. I don't think the time series is going to allow you to disentangle it. So that point is well taken. Uh, on inflation, we would love to do it without a uh, local shelter. Uh, so this new series which came out, uh, you just mentioned starting from 78, we potentially uh, would love to use that. Otherwise, we just don't have the data. So the CPI doesn't give us this data before 78, and you have to go to the PLS and apply for it, and it takes a long while. Uh, so uh, to the extent that we can use these new measures, but not more instance, and we definitely uh, want to do that. It's, it's a fair point. And then the borrowing rate, that's just sort of the history of the paper. Uh, you know, the credit crunches now have sort of a more prominent role. We think they're really important. Actually, there were frictions. It was one giant friction, but that also raised the uh, lending rates. So we think that's actually quite important. That hasn't made it yet into the cross-sectional analysis, but that's a very fair point. We, sh we should do that. Um, so thanks a lot for the comments. Uh, and I would love to take some questions at this time. Um, okay, so let's uh, go through like one or two questions. So the first question, Alessandro uh, Rabucci from uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, please uh, ask your question. You should unmute yourself. Hello. Hi, we can hear you. Alessandro, you're muted again. If you want, I can just read out his question because I, I see it. Uh, I'm not sure everybody can see it, but it's basically asking how does it relate to work by uh, my dear colleague, Thomas Philippon, uh, which looks at the cost of finance, see that reverted in 1965. So the short answer is, uh, I should really talk to Thomas uh, about this relationship. We haven't thought much about it. Uh, now, arguably, uh, we've looked a bit at bank profitability. Clearly, uh, this regulation, regulation Q, had a big effect on that. So uh, I think that's a point well taken. And, and you know, uh, we think regulation could have all kinds of effects. So it should relate to Thomas' work. I will look into that. Uh, okay, Sebastian Anfante, uh, he has his uh, hand up. I don't know if it disappeared or um, so. Sebastian? Okay, he doesn't seem to be here. So, Afsin Sahin, uh, 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 please go ahead and ask your question. You should unmute yourself. 
I would like to ask about worker rule. I mean, when you compare uh, your uh, regulation uh, findings, and uh, how should we judge uh, worker rule when we consider uh, many books such as Mishkin? I mean, uh, most of them emphasize the role of uh, high interest rates uh, during 1980s. And when uh, Walker increased uh, federal funds rate, inflation decreased. Uh, there is a, a very a popular narrative, as you know. So uh, you mentioned the role of regulation. And when you compare with uh, central bank's policy, uh, what do you think about that? Which one is dominant for controlling uh, inflation? Yes, uh, so regulation I... or uh, increasing interest rates? Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, we are the newcomers to this topic. Uh, and so, you know, in some sense, there is a long literature uh, which argues it's all about the monetary policy rules. I think, you know, we want to put uh, up at least for discussion that the financial system and financial repression played a role. Now, how important each one is, I, I don't quite know yet. Uh, I think, you know, we're going to do more work on this. I should say, you know, Mishkin has a very nice survey article about how monetary policy worked. And he sort of argues the bank lending channel was uh, working reasonably well during this time and then stopped working. Uh, and I think Beneke has also sort of made similar comments. And uh, in some sense, you know, this is potential an explanation why it worked during that time. Uh, that's what I refer to sort of as the credit crunch. So we, we think, you know, in some sense, we are touching upon uh, bits and pieces in the literature, especially the work on the credit crunches during those times, which, which has looked at this, but it hasn't made the connection to inflation. And so I think, you know, it's up for debate of how much of uh, our results could potentially account for the total variation in inflation. Uh, 